Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I imagine over the last several weeks, you've heard a lot of different things, people's opinions about Christmas. You've heard people, or maybe programs on TV, telling you that Christmas is partly about a magic hat that brings some gnome into life. Maybe you've heard that part of the magic of Christmas is a glowing red nose on a flying reindeer that helps Santa get through the crowd and clouds and bring presents to good little boys and girls. Maybe you've heard that Christmas is about a miser who drank the milk of human kindness and became a different person and made Christmas a different thing entirely for many people. There's all sorts of different opinions out there today about what Christmas is all about. But we know that although there are many opinions, there is only one truth, isn't there? And that truth is to be found alone in the scriptures. That truth is revealed there for us in the Old Testament to give us clues about who it was that was coming whom God had decided should be born of a virgin of the family of David whose rule was for it from eternity and who might be found in a nursery or a manger in Bethlehem. We know all of these things only because you and I have opened the Bible. And there we have read for ourselves the witness of history, the witness of God's Word, the witness about what Christmas really is. We know the magic of Christmas, so to speak, as the world would proclaim it. It's actually the miracle of Christmas, isn't it? It's the miracle of a virgin birth, of a child born in a manger, the miracle of God wrapped in human flesh. But there is a second miracle of Christmas that we, if we fall into the haste of the world, putting it all away on December 26, may overlook entirely. What is the second miracle of Christmas, we might ask? That miracle is simply this, that God in his love has revealed the miracle of Christ's birth to you and me, yes, even to me, because the second miracle of Christmas is the gift of faith. It's a gift that God has wrapped up and placed into our hearts. We might ask, why don't more people know about the real reason of Christmas? Why are they missing it? And the answer is very simple. Our human nature, that's the answer, isn't it? Our human nature wants to place our fallacious, our false reason above everything else. It maybe doesn't make sense to them, or if they happen to stumble into the Bible, maybe they don't even want to hear what the message is because, as St. Paul tells us, the heart that is natural is darkened by sin. And our human nature being what it is, wants to hide in that darkness. The light of Christ is a fearsome thing for those in the darkness because it exposes their deeds, as Scripture says to us. And who, after all, wants all of those private things exposed to the world, let alone to a living God? But God in his mercy, God in his love comes to us amidst the light of Christ and he shines his light on all the world. And yet only those, only those who have had the Lord working faith in their heart, because faith after all is a work of God, will hear and believe the message. 
We don't like the message in our natural selves, do we? We have this desire in some way to contribute to our salvation, either by making a choice to believe what God has already placed before us, or if not to choose it, simply to in some way reach God and meet him halfway by the good things we do and wanting to be recognized for those good things. We want a reward. That's what the natural person wants. Why would I give up all of those things that God talks about in the Ten Commandments if I wasn't going to get something, if I hadn't earned something for myself? If I hadn't done something good and made a choice for Jesus? That's worldly thinking. That's the natural man at work. Wanting to stand before God on our own merit. But the scripture reminds us again and again that it's not by merit, but entirely by grace. If it was something that we could earn, it wouldn't be grace anymore. But God in his mercy reminds us that it's all his work from beginning to end. Even the faith that he has placed in our heart is the working of God. Because what is Christmas after all? But God leaving his throne in heaven and coming all the way to earth, being wrapped in our humanity and coming to us to find us in the midst of the darkness and to call us into the light. In fact, even the message of the angels is the message of faith. God has now established his peace and his goodwill, his favor with us. From beginning to end, it's all about God. Now Jesus had been teaching all throughout Galilee. He'd been teaching the message of faith to all of the people living there. He hadn't been traveling Judea. The leaders in Judea were seeking to kill him. And his brothers came to him at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles and said, are you coming with us to Jerusalem? And initially he said, no, I'm not going to the feast this year. But after they had left, he went to the feast secretly. The Feast of Tabernacles is in the 15th day of the month of Tishri, which we all know is September and October. God commands the Feast of Tabernacle as one of three feasts that all the men of Israel were required to assemble at the temple in Jerusalem. This feast was the one that came after the harvest and after all the grapes had been removed from the wine presses. It was a celebration. And Jesus appeared about halfway through that celebration in the temple teaching. And people were amazed at this. And they said, could anyone do more signs than this man? He must be the Messiah. Now, one of the things that happened for all the seven and later nine days of the Feast of Tabernacles, of the Harvest Festival or any gathering, was that a priest would leave the temple with a golden pitcher, an ur, of about two and a half liters. And he would walk from the temple down the mountain to the pool of Siloam, which Solomon had built. And there in that water that ushered through a tunnel from the spring of Gion, he would fill that golden pitcher. He'd be accompanied by temple musicians. He'd be accompanied by a festal procession of the people. And then he would make his way back to the temple. And there at the gates, the, the priest would blow a shofar, a ram's horn, three times to welcome him. And then he would prepare, or proceed up the ramp to the altar. Water from the, the pool of Siloam poured into a silver ore with a spout and wine of equal amount poured into another silver ore on the other side of the altar. And there they would be poured out simultaneously, water and wine, on the altar as a drink offering. This happened each day of the festival. 
It was on the last day of the festival that Jesus said to the people, and let me read it to you from verses 37 and 38. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me has the scripture, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. <coughs> Tying the message of God to the action of worship at the temple altar, he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Well, people then were suddenly stirred. It tells us in verse 39 that what Jesus was saying is that the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive is the water that ushers up to living water. But to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Pentecost had not happened. And the interesting thing about the pouring of these drink offerings was, first of all, it meant the representation of the water of life by which the children of Israel were given, a thir quenched their thirst in the wilderness. You remember Moses striking the rock. The second was for God, a prayer for God to bring after the harvest festival. And the third from Isaiah who says, let him draw from the well of salvation was intended to remind the people of the outpouring of the Spirit of God at the arrival of the Messiah. And Jesus stood up and said, let them drink from me if they are thirsty. You can imagine the discussion that suddenly broke out. Nobody had been speaking about Jesus publicly for fear of the leadership, but now people were divided. And they began to ask and say, first group, surely this man is the prophet. The prophet Moses spoke of in Deuteronomy 18, um, that God would send one like Moses who knew God intimately and spoke to him face to face. Another group said, he's not just a prophet. He's the Christ. He is the Messiah, the anointed Savior, King, High Priest of God. And a third group said, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Doesn't the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town? where David lived, and so the people were divided. <coughs> well, the answer to the scriptures, or the answer to the opinions, is found in the scriptures, isn't it? And so they had to turn there. Jesus, they knew, was a popular man preaching in Galilee. Jesus, they knew, at least grew up in a remote little town called Nazareth. And Jesus did all of his prophesying, or most of it, up in the north. They didn't know, as you and I know, that he was the child of David. And so there was a division. And human opinion began to rule, much as it does today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Much as it does today. What do people say about Jesus in the world around us today? What do they have to say about Christmas? There is many opinions, but there is only one truth, and that truth is found in the Scripture. That truth tells us that God came to us when we were lost in the darkness and brought us light. That truth tells us that Jesus is the one foretold, that he is the one that fulfills all that God had promised. Jesus is the one in whom we see the love and grace of God in the midst of our sin, in the midst of death. Jesus is the one who brings us life and salvation 
in our darkness. Jesus has come to you at some time in your life, probably when you were a child, and he poured his water of life on your forehead. And at that time, you received the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of faith that God, through his working and water in the word, created in your heart. As you grew, you came to church and to Sunday school and to catechism. And that word of God dwelt within you and you were married to that word and it produced fruit in your life and you believed and you grew in wisdom and understanding of God's love for you. When the time was right and you were confirmed, you came to the altar of God and here the very flesh and blood of Jesus was given to you and continues to be given to you in the water in the wine and the bread. These are the means by which God comes to you each day in grace. He comes to you through these means of word and sacrament so that you you might believe in him. That faith which is his working in you might be strengthened. And by that faith, all of God's blessings that he intends for you might be appropriated by you. Especially the forgiveness of your sins, life, and salvation. You enjoy the second miracle of Christmas because God loves you. And because he has created faith in your heart. And he comes to you daily. You, yes, even you. And through these means of grace, reassures you of his love. Yes, there's many opinions out there about Jesus and about Christmas. Magic hats and reindeer noses and all sorts of different things that tell wonderful and moving stories about things that deal with Christmas. But the one truth of Christmas is found in God's word alone. Where he reveals himself to you in his love. By his grace. And says to you, you are mine. I love you. And because he does, we carry that message out into the world and we become his light to others. Many opinions, but only one truth. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to hear more on this topic or any other, please contact us. Or join us Sunday mornings for worship at 9 o'clock, Bible class at 10 30.